So when Angus trapped me offside uh, into speaking here today, uh, he said, what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, well, what do people usually talk about? And he said, oh, big, you know, big stuff about the future of the business, the economy, that kind of stuff. What, what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, as it's in January, I'll talk about my New Year's resolutions. And I, I don't think he believed me. Um, and neither did I until I had to sit and think about what they were last night. Um, but that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to you about my New Year's resolutions. Um, the first of which is that there are a whole load of words that I'm not going to use this year. Uh, I'm not going to use the word space, as in in the digital space, because uh, I'm just fed up with it. Uh, I'm not going to use the word algorithm, um, which kind of came from nowhere. It used to be something that we talked about a lot in math. So, and, uh, <laughs> and then suddenly, algorithm, changing the algorithm replaced shifting the paradigm. Uh, and, and an algorithm and a paradigm have got nothing to do with each other, but that's it. That, the paradigm shift hit the fan and got replaced by, by a change of algorithm. So I'm not doing that. I'm not going to use the word holistic or platform or zeitgeist or synergy. Those words are all expunged from my lexicon for 2011. So that's the first one. The second resolution for 2011 is I'm going to stand up more. Um, two reasons. Uh, I was involved in an anti-obesity campaign um, and I had a fascinating conversation with a guy who started the 24-hour fitness chain of gyms in the, in the States who after, he, he's got 2,000 gyms and after building all these gyms and getting all these members he, he realised as he put it that he'd done a really fantastic job of, of, of keeping fit people fit but not a great job of getting fat people fit. So he embarked on three years of research to figure out what to do, and it, and it all comes down to standing. Is you, you use twice as many calories when you're standing as you do when you're sitting down, and if you walk around, you use twice as many again. Um, so I've had my um, desk mounted on the wall, so, <laughs> so, so now I stand when I'm doing any emails uh, and stand when I'm talking on the phone. My emails have got shorter. Which is, a, which is a good thing. I'm also going to stand up more. Um, Jonathan's, Jonathan's boss, a wonderful guy called Phil Kent, who runs uh, all of Turner's uh, broadcasting operations, used to, he, he used to be a Hollywood agent. Uh, he's a really nice guy. And he and I were chatting one day, um, and he said, the most important lesson I learned as an agent was whenever somebody walks into your office, you must immediately stand up. And I said, why is that? He said, because they can't sit down then. So if, you, if somebody walks in, <laughs> you immediately stand up. They can't sit down. You can then figure out whether you want to give them any time or not. <clears throat> and, uh, and if you don't, you just start walking and they can follow you. But eventually, <laughs> eventually you're going to lose them. So I'm going to do a lot more standing up in 2011. I'm also not having any half hour or hour meetings. Uh, it's one of... Life's mysteries is that we've become programmed by outlook. Um, that all meetings are either half an hour or an hour when there's no reason for that. So uh, no more of those. Um, uh, I'm going to have like 18 minute meetings or 33 minute meetings, but not half hour or an hour. Um, Jonathan talked about how everybody's got through the, uh, seems to have got through the crisis. Um, uh, in, in February of 2009, I um, was having breakfast with Jeff Immelt, who's the CEO of GE, um, one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. Um, and I was very depressed about the way things were going and how the government was going to start throwing money away. And Jeff, in his usual way, said, Listen, for God's sake, Andrew, you've just got to get over it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, look, it's not a, the, the governments are all going to spend the money. Um, and they'll spend the money because there is no other plan. Um, and it doesn't have to be a bad thing. I said, go on. And he said, well, um, of course you can worry about what it's going to do for inflation and tax rates and your kids' inheritance and all that sort of stuff. But the fact of the matter is, if you spend the money smartly, it can work out. And, and he said, the things that determine whether it's smart or not are, first, it should be spent on programs that are going to create jobs fast. So. 5,000 jobs in, in February is worth more than 10,000 jobs in August. 
He said, the second thing that really matters is that all of that money gets spent solving one big problem. So, so that at the end of it, if you've mortgaged the future, at least you'll be able to say, but we'll never again have to invade Iraq to get access to oil because of our energy independence. And he said, in the case of the US, there are three big problems, healthcare, energy dependence, and education. He said, I don't know what you do about education, but with a couple of trillion dollars over three years, you could solve healthcare and you could solve energy dependence. Um, and he said, I can make money out of both, so I don't mind. But <laughs> so I, I started to feel a little bit perkier about things. I said, no, I, hadn't, I never thought about that. But, and he said, the priorities would be different for different countries. But, so I said, well, uh, you, you made me feel a lot better. And he said, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> because that's not how governments work. They're going to put a little bit of money and place lots and lots of bets and pay back lots and lots of favours, um, with the single exception of China, uh, where they will use these three years and their two, three trillion dollar um, a stimulus process to build the infrastructure that they need to move manufacturing a thousand miles west from the eastern strip of China, where labor costs are one quarter of what they are on the eastern strip of China, where, by the way, they're already one quarter of what they are here. The Chinese will do that. And lo and behold, they have. The point of all of this, though, was then I then said, well, you know, what do we do? And he, he said something really, uh, really smart. He said, just don't forget what you believe in. Don't forget what you believe in. Um, and in, our, in his case, he said, we believe in big markets, we believe in infrastructure, we believe in, in uh, the developing world. Um, so, so my third resolution, which I sort of have to remember every year, is uh, not to forget what we believe in. And, and in our case, uh, it is about the work, the work, the work, the work, the importance and value of great work uh, is increasing every single day as the number of opportunities and nature of the opportunities that consumers have to, to use their time increases, so too does the value of great work because um, the only way uh, that we can persuade people to behave differently is by earning their attention, not just buying it. Um, and the key to that is creativity. And creativity, uh, which we define as a, the magical ability, and it is magical, um, there is no formula for it, to uh, capture and hold the attention of an audience while you give them an experience that changes their behavior. That's the business that we're in, as becoming more and more valuable every single year. As part of that, my fourth resolution is to rediscover the magic of television. Um, yeah, there, I've said it. Um, it's it, like, f for the last 10 years, talking about the brilliance of television was, was roughly like um, suggesting that creationism should be taught in schools. Um, you, you were sort of drummed out of any event as being some kind of dinosaur who was stuck in the past, uh, when, in fact, those pesky little consumers uh, just carried on watching and watched more and more, in fact. In the last three months, it's suddenly become OK to talk about television again, uh, which I'm very relieved about, because the simple truth of the matter is that for the vast majority of our clients, it remains an extraordinarily powerful medium uh, because consumers like watching television, and an awful lot of them do, and frankly, without scale, there is no sale. Um, and I think if you look, and Donald is probably best equipped to, to do this, if you look at a lot of what's happened over the last five years, as we've all become obsessed with everything but television, um, I think the quality of television advertising has actually gone down, whereas the quality of all the other forms of advertising has gone up, and we now need to refocus on television and get television back, back up. Not instead of, but as well as uh, digital, which is my fifth res uh, resolution, which is to learn to dream in digital. Uh, we believe that digital isn't a language, uh, sorry, isn't a platform or a medium or a technology, it's a language. It's something that we use to communicate ideas and create experiences that people um, have that change their behavior. Um, 
And it's a language that has a different syntax and a different grammar from some of the other languages that we work in. When you're learning a new language, there's three levels that you work through. The first one is when you can understand somebody else speaking a language but can't yet speak it. The second level is when you can understand somebody who's speaking the language and speak to them in the language. But the third level, which is when you really, really know you've learned the language, is when you wake up one morning and realize that you dreamt in French, or dreamt in Spanish, or you dreamt in whatever language you're learning. And the challenge for us is to get um, everybody to the point where they're dreaming in digital. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the best way of getting there is. We've got lots and lots of experiments on the, on the go around the world. Uh, I do remember seeing a fascinating documentary about a guy who teaches languages in three days. His, uh, his proposition is he gets six people in a room and without a book, a blackboard, a screen, uh, a pencil, teaches them any language they want in three days. Um, and and the, the principle is that you, um, you go from knowing nothing to being able to speak in about 18 months as a baby um, by picking out words that are useful and repeating the ones that are most useful. And, and his thing is you can compress that to three days if you know what you're doing uh, as an adult. But there's a condition that, uh, that is attached to it, which is the minute you finish the three days, you have to immediately be immersed in a world where you have to keep working in that language. Otherwise, it disappears very fast as well. And I think the key to learning to dream in digital, it lies somewhere in that. You've got, to, you've got to immerse yourself in it and then immediately start working in it. It's not good enough just to go and learn about it and then go back to what you were doing before. So that's our, that's our um, fifth resolution. Um, the sixth one is to simplify, 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 simplify. Um, what I hear more and more from our clients uh, is that they, they need us to help them simplify what gets done and how it gets done. Uh, and that is, that's different from skimming. Simplification takes a lot of hard work, uh, but it's worth doing. Um, again, I think one of the big reactions to the, oh, it's not all about television anymore, was people went from doing one thing to doing everything. Uh, and actually, we've got to have a structure and a process for determining what we should do uh, rather than all of the things we could do. Um, and that takes hard work. Uh, my, my seventh one is to diversify, diversify. Uh, and I don't mean by nature of business. I mean creating more diverse agencies and a more diverse culture. And I'll be honest, I was a late convert to this. When I first moved to the States, I was horrified at the prospects of setting targets for, um, for different minorities. Um, uh, but I'm now a great believer in it, because I'd, I honestly think that unless you deliberately try to change the makeup of your agency, it won't happen fast enough. Um, we've done a, we've done a, a terrific job um, uh, in terms of uh, female representation in our most senior management, but some of our largest markets, uh, France, Russia, um, China, and in the UK, where I'm lucky enough to have two, com not one, but two commanders of the British Empire, uh, both female. Um, but we've done a lousy job of really pushing um, the, the growth of ethnic diversity. Uh, and we need to. We need to put a lot of effort into that. The eighth one is, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, really try to remember to differentiate between puzzles and mysteries and approach them differently. Um, I read a, an amazing article by the head of national security during the, the Gulf War who talked about the difference between puzzles and mysteries um, and what you had to do to solve them. Um, uh, a puzzle has a, has a right answer. And usually what's missing is the information that you need to solve the puzzle. So in his terms, the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden is a puzzle. He is somewhere, we just don't have the information to find him. By contrast, a mystery doesn't have a definitive outcome. There isn't an answer to a mystery. There are a whole load of possible scenarios. And you have to um, make better judgments and do better analysis to solve a mystery. Uh, 
The last thing you need to do when you're trying... So, for example, what will happen to Iraq after Saddam Hussein is toppled? That's not a puzzle. There is no one answer. That's a mystery. The important thing when you're dealing with mysteries, though, is not to go and get more information. When you're solving a puzzle, you need information. When you're solving a mystery, you usually have too much information. Uh, and, you need to get, and you need to get rid of some and just concentrate on, um, on mapping out scenarios and, and, uh, and identifying possible outcomes. And this sounds like a weird thing to do to talk, when you're talking about advertising, but we spend a lot of our time treating parts of our business as if they're a mystery. Oh, sorry, as if they're a puzzle when they're not. And other parts of our business as if they're a mystery when they're actually a puzzle. Um, for, for example, ninth resolution. Measure the worth of everything. Measure the worth of everything. Identifying the contribution through the change in behaviour uh, of an investment in media dollars or of a particular piece of, uh, of work, that is a puzzle. It can be done. You've just got to do the work. You've got to get the information, model it and do it. And we should be doing much, much more of that than we are uh, as an industry and as an agency. So we're going we're to put more effort into that. That's number nine. The tenth one is um, that to remember that the creative process, Adrian was just talking about it, is artistry. It is an art. I was, uh, I was lucky enough last September to go and spend a few days in, um, in Florence, um, where in addition to learning how to make a magnificent tiramisu, um, the key to which is to use a meringue mix instead of double cream, I learned a lot about Michelangelo. Um, and I hadn't thought about it until after I got back, but um, Michelangelo and the artists of his time had much more in common with the people who create advertising than I'd thought. Uh, up until very late in his life, all art, all art was commercial. Every piece of work was commissioned uh, very specifically, from often from workshops uh, where the master, and there weren't sadly enough mistresses, of the workshop would teach the craft to artists. Um, everything was commissioned. There was not yet a moment where somebody would have a flash of inspiration, um, <coughs> saw a calf in half stick it in a tank full of formaldehyde and, and hope that um, Charles Sarchi could create a market for it. That didn't happen. All work was commissioned. And uh, most of it, not surprisingly, by very rich people, including the church. Uh, the best of it, like the best of advertising, uh, drew very strongly on emotions. It was designed to uh, make people feel good about the people who'd commissioned it make the public feel good about the people who'd commissioned it. Um, it was often inspired or used borrowed values, most of them from the Bible. I, I, w I will confess as a little diversion, it does amaze me that after all of those years where all art was, was basically driven by the Bible, at the end of the Renaissance, when artists were finally able to do what they wanted, they chose to go for bowls of fruit. <laughs> That, that was it, bowls of fruit. Um, anyway, that's an aside. So, so uh, most, uh, Michelangelo, his biggest client was the Medici's. Um, they actually kind of totally owned him. He had to live in the garden, um, which I guess was a, I guess it was like having a car account in Detroit um, until a few years ago. And uh, he was given the brief one day, uh, do me a David. Um, and David had been done thousands of times. David had been done as paintings and as sculptures, literally thousands of times. And yet, Michelangelo, uh, I guess the equivalent of do me a David for us, is do me refreshing, or do me taste better, or if you're in the car, is do me 
This is the car that appeals to the head and the heart. Um, or this will really fill you up. Um, he managed to um, stick to the brief and break all the conventions. Um, he had a fresh insight, which was to present David not as something vulnerable, but as something strong and brave. Uh, up until Michelangelo's David, he had always been represented as a teenage boy in a toga after he'd killed Goliath, usually Goliath's head lying at his feet. And Michelangelo did David as a fully grown man, completely naked, before he threw, before he slung the stones at uh, Goliath, which, which meant that he, have, he has him looking up instead of looking at you. Uh, he, he managed to get into his face this combination of kind of determination and, and fear uh, that no other representation of David had ever done. Um, he claimed that he didn't create David, he revealed him. Uh, and the best advertising does the same thing. The best advertising doesn't invent the truth, it reveals it. Uh, he claimed that he was in the marble all the time and all he did was remove everything that was getting in the way, uh, which the best advertising does. Um, it also gave him the most fantastic out for when he couldn't solve a problem, uh, which we've also heard in advertising, which is it's just not in there. <laughs> I've, tr I've tried, it's just not in there. Uh, he was extremely good at coping with changes in the brief. Um, there's a wonderful story about how he was summoned by... Um, the, second, uh, the second Medici po uh, Pope, Julius, who asked him to go to Rome to do 40 sculptures for his tomb, which that's like the big brand campaign, you know, 40 sculptures for the tomb. When he got to Rome, uh, which was quite a schlep in those days, uh, the Pope said, yeah, uh, the brief's changed. It's not 40 sculptures now. Um, maybe we'll do seven, but... Um, I'd like you to paint the ceiling. Now, that's a bit like saying, I know you came to do the big brain campaign, but I'd like you to do some, some kind of black and white print stuff. And it, he could have said, look, I'm, the, I'm a sculptor. I, I'm a sculptor. I, do, I don't do ceilings. I'll get another team to do the ceilings. Um, but he didn't. He didn't. And he created as we all know, a magical, magical ceiling. He was an obsessive craftsman, as all of the great writers and art directors in our business are. It took him three years to make his David. Um, we never have that amount of time, but, but if we did, the best people in this business would use it. Uh, they would use it to craft something that brilliant. So I don't, I don't begin to pretend that the best work that we've done should be compared with the work that uh, Michelangelo has done. But I do believe that our writers and art directors should describe themselves as artists and should be proud of the fact that they're artists. Um, so my 10th resolution is to celebrate artistry and art. Um, I have one more uh, resolution, which is my 11th uh, which is not to have any more lists of ten. <laughs> so, thank you very much.